So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. J. Michael Francis, and I know we are anxious to know what he has discovered since his most recent trip to Spain. At least that's what he, you know, what he can let us know <laughs> and without having to shoot us. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, here's uh, Dr. J. Michael Francis. Thank you for the kind invitation. And, and to all the familiar faces and some new faces uh, out here today and those who have joined us online, February has February 1st passed already? <laughs> oh, we didn't launch on, t we failed. Uh, but I'm going to talk about this. We're so close. We're so close to launching this project. Um, but it's a privilege to be here uh, this evening. And uh, you know, I'd like to thank Thomas for the kind invitation to open this speaker series and, and the 25th anniversary to Fort Mose and the Historical Society. Congratulations. What I'd like to do a little bit, uh, what I'd like to do tonight is, is not specifically focus on Mose, but rather the presence of people of African descent in Florida, and in particular in St. Augustine, and then tell you how that fits in to this project that we've been working on. It seems like since the time I turned four, uh, I've been working on this project, but we're, we are, like I said, quite close to, uh, to being able to launch. <coughs> I've said this over and over and over again in classes over the years uh, about early expeditions to Florida, and when you look at these, the principal Spanish expeditions to Florida in the 16th century, there was not a single expedition to Florida that did not include people of African descent. They're on all of them, uh, both free and enslaved. Uh, surprisingly large numbers with the Hernando de Soto expedition, and like I said, with all of these. Uh, the most famous and I think familiar to, to most of you is, is, the, is Juan Garrido, uh, who arrived in Florida with Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513 and participated in that first expedition and then six years later joined a more famous expedition led by the Spaniard Hernando Cortes uh, into Mexico. And this is the first page of Juan Garrido's proof of merit petition. This was a petition that he submitted, he, he didn't write this, uh, but it's a petition that he submitted to the Spanish crown requesting honor, benefits, and, uh, and some uh, financial rewards for his services to the crown over the years. And in this petition, he outlines all of his services. Uh, one of which was his participation in Ponce's expedition. But he also says that he was the first person to introduce wheat into Mexico. I, I promise you, I never got that tour in Mexico City. In Mexico, nobody ever said the first wheat produced in Mexico City was Juan Garrido's wheat, uh, who was this free black conquistador. Uh, he also claims in this petition that he built the first Christian chapel in Mexico City. So this is all part of what, uh, what I call this title, Hidden in Plain Sight. People of African descent are in all of these expeditions early on and as part of uh, St. Augustine's fabric uh, from the very first day of the city's founding in 1565. And that brings us to Menendez. So in 1565, uh, one of the things we've done uh, in this digital history project is try to piece together as many of the individuals who came on that expedition in 1565. And we've identified to date just over 600 by name. Uh, many of them we have places of residence and we have more biographical information about them. But on that expedition and as Menendez sailed to different parts of uh, Florida on the Atlantic coast and on the Gulf Coast, we start to see the presence of other individuals of African descent, kind of hidden in documents where uh, they've been largely overlooked. And so this is a muster roll from St. Augustine from, 15, from, the, from 1566 and 1567. And one of the names we see here is Luis, who's a mulatto, who's a translator from the land of Carlos, Calusa territory. This is the only reference we have in these records to Luis, this mulatto translator uh, who was likely shipwrecked uh, and ended up in Calusa territory in Florida. Then we see another entry in the same muster roll for Juanillo Negro, 
who was taken captive by Saturiba. And he was imprisoned and he served as a translator. So here you have, and then you have a marginal note, uh, Menendez uh, sent Juanillo into the Caribbean on another expedition in 1567 and, he, and disappears. Uh, haven't been able to find him in other sources. This is probably the most interesting one, I think, of the whole list of those early records related to people of African descent in St. Augustine. This, as far as I can tell, is the oldest documented marriage record for the United States. That includes Puerto Rico. It's a record of a 1565 marriage, a marriage that was celebrated in St. Augustine in the fall of 1565, so within months of Menendez's landing. And it's a marriage of uh, a woman named Luisa de Abrego, who married a gentleman named Miguel Rodriguez, native of the city of Segovia. What it also tells us is Luisa de Abrego is a native of Seville, that she's also a free black woman. So the oldest documented marriage we have for the United States is an interracial marriage between a free black woman from Seville, Spain and a Spanish soldier from Segovia. Uh, I, I always think that if this had happened in Texas or California or in New England, this document would be in every school grade textbook, people would be talking about this, and yet it remains, again, one of these many, so many hidden narratives, forgotten narratives for Florida. It doesn't take long to find other references, uh, in particular from a section in the archive of the Indies called Contaduría. Contaduría sections for Florida, those early colonial Florida papers, are about 15,000 pages that look a lot like this. And I'll show you what some of the other pages look like. They're, they're pretty miserable uh, paleography. But periodically you find things, just scattered things. So here's another muster roll that mentions Juan Fernandez el Negro. Or you get a record like this that speaks about a gentleman named Domingo and a little black girl named Catalina, who's the daughter of Inés, who is also a slave de su majestad, a royal slave. We'll talk a little bit more about royal slaves uh, coming up. Well, this little girl, Catalina and Domingo, were both suffering from the plague. And this is a document. The reason this document exists is because it's a, an expenditure from the royal hospital for the treatment uh, for the, the plague that uh, these two individuals suffered. And here you have the name of the surgeon, Juan, who, who was a Frenchman uh, at this time uh, in Florida. We get other scattered documents. This is a document out of the archive of uh, the ancestor, a descendant, I should say, of uh, Florida's governor, Gonzalo Mendez de Canso. And this document records the founding, his founding of the hospital in St. Augustine uh, at the end of the 16th century. And in that document, we see that he leaves aside money to support uh, a woman to serve as effectively as nurse custodian in that hospital. And her name, all we know about her is that her name was Maria and she was also an enslaved African woman. Really kind of the first documented or early documented nurses uh, here. Uh, in terms of the kinds of work that people of African descent, slaves in particular, uh, who worked for the crown, uh, these royal slaves, the kind of work you typically see in the documentation uh, that they were assigned to do included these. So they did a, a agricultural work and domestic, they helped build, design, collect construction material for the forts, uh, they mined uh, stone quarries, uh, they, they, uh, they, they made palm uh, match cord and illegally uh, the governor and others rented this pool, which was against the law. Uh, they weren't supposed to do this, but uh, often you see that, well, you might be surprised that governors didn't always follow the law. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so you see these other kinds of activities uh, taking place. This contaduría material also includes, I think we have almost 30 years consecutively of the rations, the monthly rations for royal slaves in St. Augustine. 
So this is other additional kind of information in terms of uh, maize and cured meat and oil and salt uh, that they received in terms of monthly rations. Now this isn't all that, of course, that, that they would have eaten. Uh, they would also have had fresh fish. Uh, but it's surprising in that list, I think there's only one month in that 30-year span where they are given fresh meat. All the meat is, is cured in these tasajos, uh, jerky, basically. And then we see the earliest record in the parish records. And I'm going to come to the parish records, which is really the bulk of the, com of, the, of the talk this evening. The earliest documented reference we have to an enslaved person in the parish records dates to January 5th, 1595. And it's badly damaged. You can see that the corner is completely torn, so it was torn even before they preserved these records in the 20s by shrink wrapping them. Uh, so you're missing a lot of information. So just when it says the woman's name, Gratia, slave of blank. But then you get the second part, Talina. Oh, that's okay. Am I, am I speaking too loudly or something? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> this is a woman we know now. We know who this woman was. Uh, this is a woman named Catalina Valdez, or Catalina de Valdez. And there's a long story about this woman of Gratia, uh, uh, about this woman Gratia, in the parish records, because we think we have not only a marriage record for her, but we also have her death and burial record. Uh, she lived a long time in St. Augustine, uh, and it's a remarkable story kind of connecting uh, uh, Gratia's uh, presence in the city uh, over more than four decades uh, that she's there uh, as this woman, Catalina Valdez's uh, slave. This I came across just recently, and, and, I, and I know that, uh, that in all likelihood others have seen these records as well, but it was just so telling, again, this is a record that records the uh, auction of belongings that, uh, that were owned by St. Augustine's treasurer, Juan de Cebadilla. And Juan de Cebadilla died in Mexico. He went to Mexico to collect the annual subsidy for the garrison, and he died there. And when news, uh, when, when news of his death reached St. Augustine, the governor sequestered much of his property and auctioned some of his property. Of that property, uh, Juan de Cebadilla owned at least six slaves, five of them female, five of them women. And, and what the start of this record shows is that this is uh, Governor Gonzalo Mendez de Canso, again, ordered a public auction to sell these five girls and one man uh, in St. In Saint Augustine. And here are these early records. This is what these Contaduría documents look like. It gives you an idea why very few people decide, oh, I'm going to spend my life reading these uh, because they make you go blind, and in fact, in the Archive of the Indies, uh, some of these sections, they won't even let you look at them now because they're in such terrible condition. So the only surviving records, in fact, are microfilm records at the University of Florida and special collections for these. So here you have this record, uh, and I want to highlight this entry right here. Uh, you see the entry at the bottom, and it's an entry for Maria, who's black, and then it tells you that Juan Garcia de Navia Castrillon was the person who purchased her at that auction. And it gives the price, and then it moves to the next individual. And you see these two entries here. Uh, one is the purchase of another uh, uh, slave named Madalena, uh, who was purchased by Ensign Hernando de Mestas, whose name might be familiar to some of you. I'm going to show you uh, why it might be familiar to some of you. And then this entry here uh, records the sale of una mulatilla, a small, a little girl, a little mulata child uh, named Felipa. We might have Felipa's marriage record. 
And this is something, again, we'll get to as we go through these parish records. In any case, these records then, all from 1597, they all date from within a six-month period in 1597. Uh, and you see this is the 1594-95 map of St. Augustine that Hernando de Mestas uh, created. Uh, so this is the same ensign, Hernando de Mestas, who purchased uh, Madalena, uh, one of the slaves of the royal treasurer. All of this is happening in the 16th century, from 1513, recorded. Never mind what's not recorded. 1513 to 1619, uh, those records, those earlier records, um, you know, uh, you look at those, th those might in fact be the earliest documented sales of enslaved Africans in what becomes the United States. So, and again, we see people of African descent throughout these records. If you look closely enough, they're everywhere. And so this narrative of the start, well, I guess it's only off by 106 years. So <laughs> it's close. Uh, I, 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 you can give them that, uh, that, that it's close. And this is a challenge. This has been a challenge. Uh, you know, I, I certainly remember, I can't, tell you how many times I heard Michael Gannon say, I don't understand why more people don't know more about Florida history in the country. Why is that? Why is that? This is at my university. <laughs> 60, I am 400, the African journey to America, 1619 to 2019. This is where I teach. <laughs> so it tells you how important I am on campus because nobody <laughs> cares whatsoever. But again, th there's this assumption that that narrative begins in 1619. It's a false assumption. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people of African descent in what becomes the United States long before the English get here. As sad as that might be for this English foundation narrative, uh, there are people of African descent more than a century. And when I start to show you some of the numbers, I think you'll be uh, quite surprised when we see what, uh, in fact, the documents are starting to uh, reveal about uh, the presence of people of African descent in St. Augustine. And, and I think part of this decision to create a digital exhibit was rooted in the kinds of comments that Michael Gannon and, and so many others have made. What are we doing wrong? You know, Michael Gannon was probably the best speaker ever, uh, and, and yet there's still this challenge of having to present a narrative that most say, well, it's marginal, it's Florida, it's not that important, it's, it's, it's not really part of a national narrative. And, and I think the decision in part to create this digital repository was driven by that desire to get the material out in an accessible way to the general public. How can we do this in a way that, uh, that students from not only uh, around Florida, but all over the country, and for that matter, all over the world, can start to see uh, what uh, Florida history, the, the richness of Florida history. And, and the first project was this project we've called Lost Voices. And this was based out of uh, uh, an initial project we started more than a decade ago to digitize the parish records in St. Augustine. Uh, I can tell you right now for the, for the period that covers the, the colonial era, bound between the earliest document we have in the parish archives, which is 1594, uh, through the, the, it goes later than this. In fact, we have a few documents into the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but not very many. Uh, there are 8,258 pages of baptism, confirmation, marriage, and death and burial records. It is the oldest parish archive in the United States. That includes Puerto Rico. And yet, it is an archive that still, I tell uh, colleagues uh, from around the country that this, about this archive, and they, where in Spain is that? It's not in Spain, it's in St. Augustine, Florida. It's behind the mother house of the Sisters of St. Joseph. That's where it's stored. It's a magnificent, magnificent collection 
Uh, and so just to give you a very brief overview of, the, uh, of that archive and, and its holdings, most of the records are baptism records. There are about 5,500 pages of baptism records. We have about 150 pages of confirmation records, but this is deceiving because the, the scribe who wrote the entries for the confirmation records must have been using a magnifying glass and decided, I'm going to fit as many names as I possibly can on each page. So there are actually thousands of individuals mentioned in these uh, confirmation records, even though there are only 150 pages. And then marriages, 1,600 pages of records, and burials, about 1,450. These records collectively speak to the fabric of colonial St. Augustine society, the people who lived here, the people who appeared and appear in the sacramental records because they were baptized. They were part of a community, a, a Catholic community in St. Augustine who were baptized, married, were confirmed, and, uh, and, and passed. And so what we wanted to do was to make these records more accessible to the general public. Because what's a teacher going to do with this? You know, so we, we, had, we had scanned all of this. It was made available. It was online. It's been online now for, uh, gosh, mm, almost eight years, nine years. Uh, Dr. Jane Landers very kindly agreed to house this on a site that she uh, put together that's housed at Vanderbilt University. And so you can look at these documents on that site. But almost immediately we started to get feedback from people. What do they say? What's in there? You know, it's nice that you have it, but how many people can read it? And how many people are going to work with it? So that is in part what launched this. <clears throat> 